What is liberty? What does it mean? People will fight to be free, but once again, liberty is under assault. How can it best be defended? I'm Ian Martin. In this series, I'll talk to leading authors and scholars. Our theme, liberty. Hal Brands is the Henry Kissinger Distinguished Professor of Global Affairs at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Does China want to build a new and liberal global order or can the forces of liberty prevail instead? Hal Brands, what does China want? Well, it's a good question, and it's one that's subject to a lot of debate within the China-watching community. I, I tend to break down China's objectives into four categories. And when we talk about China, it's important to recognize that what we're really talking about is the Chinese Communist Party uh, and Xi Jinping within that party, because this becomes very important when you think about these four things. And the first thing that the CCP uh, wants is what every authoritarian regime wants, which is to stay in power. Uh, and, and sort of the question of what does this mean for the CCP's hold on power is central to every decision that the party makes. The second thing that China wants is really to make China whole again. And so Xi Jinping's map of China is different than my map of China, of your map of China, and it includes pieces of the country that from the CCP's perspective were taken away from China when it was weak and divided. Uh, and so when Xi Jinping thinks about what greater China should look like, it would obviously include Hong Kong, it would include Taiwan, it would include uh, pieces of neighboring countries with whom China has uh, ongoing territorial disputes. It would involve all of the South China Sea, for instance. And that leads to the third uh, Chinese objective, which I think is gaining regional primacy in, in Asia. This is not unusual. This is something the United States wanted uh, when it became a great power in the late 19th century. Great powers typically like to have predominance in their neighborhood, uh, and so I think it's something that China would like very much as well. And then the fourth uh, and final objective is to make China the most powerful and influential country in the world at some point uh, in the future, probably some point in the middle of this century. And, and what we have to remember is that um, this is really kind of a reversion to the norm from a Chinese perspective. We think a lot about the rise of China Xi Jinping talks about the rejuvenation of, of China, and it speaks to this idea that China was once the most powerful and influential and advanced nation uh, in the world, the most advanced empire in the world would be a better way of putting it, and it, and it wants to return to that status at some point in the relatively near future. What would you say to those who defend China who say, look, all it wants is some respect for being the world power that it already is um, uh, in, its, in, its, in its great history? It's not seeking to, to alter the global order in any way. Is that, is that credible? I think it's less credible now than it might have been a decade or two ago. And, and so we've seen a couple of things uh, during this period that I think have made the more benign interpretation of China's motives harder to sustain. And so one is the increasing tendency to use coercion against neighbors in the South China Sea, for instance, or on the Himalayan border with India. Uh, when those neighbors get in the way of Chinese ambitions. The second is just that China's efforts to attain global influence have become much farther reaching than they were, let's say, at the beginning of this century. And so whether you're looking at the effort to you know, dominate the world's 5G telecommunications networks or the creation of the Belt and Road Initiative or the, the creation of an alternative set of international institutions, it's, it's pretty clear that Beijing is not simply looking to make a moderate adjustment in the way the world works. It really envisions a larger shift in the way the world works, one in which the international system will be increasingly Sinocentric in the future. And what do they envisage for the rest of us who are, who are not China but will have to live in this uh, Chinese global order? Well, it's, it's difficult to say, and I'm not sure even that Xi Jinping could give you a really good answer of that. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's useful to have a historical perspective in, in thinking about this. If you asked American policymakers in 1945, what is an American world order going to look like? I don't know that they could have described to you what that system ultimately looks like. They would not have predicted, for instance, that the United States would have a global network of military alliances. That was a decision that was taken later, almost in the spur of the moment in the late 
1940s, beginning with the creation of NATO. And, and the point here is that countries' objectives and the way that they pursue them evolve as countries become more powerful. If you just take what the Chinese say seriously, they would very much like to see a world in which that global network of American alliances is weakened or perhaps rendered uh, obsolete. They would very much like to see a world in which China exerts leadership through existing international institutions or perhaps through an alternative set of international institutions, a world in which countries, particularly developing countries, are very closely linked to China economically, which would give China a great deal of political and perhaps strategic influence uh, as well. And so it's hard to describe the, the end point, you know, where all that ultimately culminates, but it, it would be a pretty big shift in the world as we know it. Why do you think it is the case that uh, quite a large number of people in the West seem to have got the rise of China wrong? in the sort of 2010s, is it because people wanted to believe that as it became sort of theoretically more Western, uh, more of a free market economy, it would naturally become freer and more like ours, as we would sort of think in our arrogant Western, Western way. And we failed to spot what was, really, what was really going on and what the leadership is really all about. I think there was a degree of hubris, perhaps. And so, you know, you have to remember that a lot of these views about China were formed in the wake of the end of the Cold War. And, and so this was a time when it appeared that democracy was triumphant, free markets were triumphant, you know, large parts of the world were becoming more like the West politically and economically. And so there was a certain logic in assuming that China would have to make the same transition at a certain point, that as it became more economically prosperous, and advanced, it would undergo a political transition or that it would simply become more deeply integrated into the existing order and so it would have less reason to disrupt that order. Uh, and it was easy to make that assumption when US and Western supremacy was essentially unchallenged during the 1990s. I think the other issue though is that frankly we, we had an incentive not to see the Chinese Communist Party for what it was because as these economic ties between China and the United States and other advanced democracies developed, there would, would have been a great deal at stake in starting to disrupt some of these ties and, and to speak more candidly about how the CCP operated at home and abroad and what it might ultimately like to achieve. And so you had this combination of, of hubris and then very profitable, um, but in some ways also very entangling economic ties that made it harder to come to a realistic assessment. And it's China's uh, role in the world economy in that period, which is the real driver of low inflation in that period, isn't it? It's essentially cheap Chinese goods, so it's in our interests to, um, to pretend that it's all benign. There's maybe a bit of a parallel, isn't there, with German thinking about Russian and Russian oil and, oil and gas, that we were kind of making ourselves dependent in the West on cheap Chinese goods. I think that's fair, and I think one of the things that we've learned from COVID and also from the war in Ukraine is that developing this deep interdependence with authoritarian regimes may or may not work in changing the way they operate, but it creates a lot of vulnerabilities for countries on the other side. This is something certainly that the Germans have discovered uh, in the past few weeks, although they've been warned about it for a long time. It's something that the United States has discovered with respect to China, where you now have a situation where the, the political relationship, the diplomatic relationship is increasingly fraught, but it's also in some ways difficult to adopt a more competitive posture because of this deep economic uh, entanglement between the two societies. The, the only other point I would offer here is that there is a long American tradition of, of doing this. And so our first preference is always to create a fully integrated global system in which everyone will participate constructively. This was the Wilsonian vision at the end of World War I. This was the American preference at the end of World War II, and we hoped very much that we would find ways of integrating the Soviet Union into a one-world community as opposed to the two-worlds uh, model that eventually evolved. And it was what we tried after the end of the, the Cold War. And so in some ways, that, that optimism is a helpful trait. It, it helps make the United States effective in the world. But this is really the third time in the last century where we've seen the same story play out. And where does that come from, that optimism, idealism, essentially? I think it's probably deeply rooted in the American political tradition. And so the American political tradition, of course, is, is based in the idea that you can uh, 
create a system in which all people will be able to participate constructively and you will have you know, peaceful mechanisms for resolving disputes, sort of the ideal of, of democracy. And we translate that onto the international stage. And, and we hope that we can set up an international system that will resemble sort of the ideal of the domestic system that we've created at home. There's, there's also this very deep American belief that people everywhere want the same things that, that we do, that people everywhere want uh, political freedom, that people everywhere uh, want to live a life that we would consider to be a, a good life. And I think, again, that, that's a real strength of the American position in a lot of respects, but it sometimes does make it difficult to get authoritarian regimes right. I mean, if there's uh, you know, a, a new age of competition coming with China, or we're already in the middle of it, what should the West be doing? And what are we doing at the moment? Are we doing enough? I think a lot of the trends are headed in the right direction. My concern is whether we're getting there fast enough. And, and so I'll just give one example of this. And, and this would be the Taiwan issue. And so I think there's a growing body of evidence to suggest that the Chinese are developing if they have not already developed the capability to take Taiwan by force uh, at some point in the next few years. And it certainly seems as though there is a desire to do so if you look at the rhetoric of the CCP and you look at some of the activities that have been undertaken in and around the Taiwan Strait. I think the United States, other advanced democracies like the UK and Japan understand this. I think the Taiwanese are starting to wake up to the threat. But we're still working on a timeline that would put us in a good position to respond sometime next decade, uh, when in fact we might need to be thinking about a period of danger that emerges in the next few years. And so there's, you know, we could go into a lot of detail about the particular military capabilities that might be useful or the particular types of economic sanctions we should be preparing to level. Well, what are we going to need militarily in the West? So we're going to need a combination of, of two things. And so one is that we're going to need basically uh, to flip the Chinese military strategy against them. So China's pursued something called an anti-access area denial strategy, basically developing a lot of capabilities that make it really hard for the US Navy uh, and Air Force to operate in close proximity to China. Uh, and Taiwan is going to need something similar. Lots of sea mines, lots of anti-ship missiles, mobile air defenses and things like that, that can just make it very difficult for China to project power across the Taiwan Strait. Doing so would be very difficult for China. This would be probably the largest amphibious operation in history. And, and so if Taiwan and the United States prepare properly, they can make it exceedingly difficult. But the other thing that we'll need um, is very sophisticated power projection capabilities because the United States is going to have to come from a long way away to help. We may have to do things like helping to break a Chinese blockade of Taiwan. And so you're going to need a combination of kind of these cheap and plentiful weapons on the one hand with the, with the larger um, uh, platforms and systems that we've associated with the American way of war. And what do you think the Chinese uh, Communist Party has learnt from the, the war in Ukraine, which is obviously watching very, very closely. The war has not gone as planned for the, for the Russians. Are they learning lessons? I'm sure they are, and I think there have emerged in Washington two narratives about what they might have learned. And the, the first narrative is, from our perspective, reassuring. And it's that the Chinese have be, will have to become much more cautious as a result of this. Surely they have been sobered by uh, the difficulty that the Russians have had conquering territory in Ukraine. Surely they've been sobered by how well US uh, and UK intelligence performed in detecting the plan to invade and publicizing it. Surely they've been sobered by all the economic punishment that the democratic world has inflicted on, on Russia. And so that, that's one narrative, and, it, and I think it's, it's an optimistic one. There's an alternative narrative, though, which is that the Chinese may have learned a different set of lessons from this, uh, from this crisis. One, they may simply not believe that the United States and other countries would do to China economically what they have done to Russia. I, I think it's very difficult to imagine the United States and other countries sanctioning the Chinese central bank, for instance, in the way that was done to the Russian central bank. Um, two, they may be learning that uh, nuclear coercion works. And, and so it is a plausible lesson to take away from the Ukraine war that the Russian nuclear deterrent has deterred the United States and other countries from intervening militarily in Ukraine to help defend that country. Whether that's a correct lesson or not remains to be seen, but that's a plausible lesson that China might take away. And then the third lesson might be that it, Putin's mistake was not the invasion of Ukraine, uh, 
it was doing it incompetently and not bringing decisive power to bear immediately. And so there is uh, one interpretation that might hold that the lesson China would take away is to act decisively, bring decisive power to bear in the first 100 hours of the conflict and try to win it before outside forces can intervene. So both of these things could be true. The Chinese could become more strategically cautious but more operationally aggressive. My own view is that the second narrative is probably closer to truth. How likely do you think this, this is in the next couple of years? It, it sounds as though you think it's coming. I think the temptation will be very strong if uh, the United States and Taiwan and other countries don't uh, act to influence Xi Jinping's calculus. And, and so it's hard to assign a probability to it because that probability will be affected by things that we do or do not do in, in the intervening period. But the argument that uh, a colleague, Mike Beckley, and I make uh, in a book that we have coming out about this is that the most dangerous period will be around the middle of the 2020s, basically from, from 2024, 2025, onward through the end of the decade. That's when China will be very well positioned militarily to undertake uh, an assault on Taiwan. I, al I also think there'll be a very strong motive to do so politically, uh, to resolve this issue before Xi Jinping's run in office ends. And then finally, I, I think it will seem like a good time in the context of Taiwanese politics, because what's become clear over the past few years is that China is only going to get Taiwan back through the use of force. And I think that will become even clearer in the, in the coming years. What role does American politics play in this? Because obviously going into the next election cycle, it's, it's early, but there's the possibility of the return of, of Trump. Might sound out, out, outlandish, but it, but it could happen. What will the dynamic be? There's a lot of focus in Washington on China, but um, will America respond in a coherent way? I think the trend in American politics is toward a bipartisan consensus that China is the most significant threat the United States faces and that Taiwan is a critical link uh, in the chain of countries that, that runs down really from Japan into Southeast Asia and essentially holds the open Pacific against Chinese power. Now, what complicates things a little bit is that Taiwan is obviously not a treaty ally of the United States. In fact, the United States doesn't even recognize Taiwan as a sovereign state in, in diplomatic terms. Most countries around the world don't recognize Taiwan as a sovereign state. And so there's more ambiguity about the American response than there would be in a case like a Russian attack on the Baltic states, which are treaty allies of the United States. I think the Biden administration has tried to make as clear as it can without formally changing U.S. policy that the United States could not be indifferent to a Chinese attack on Taiwan. The president has now three times come out and explicitly said the United States would help Taiwan defend itself in the event of a Chinese assault. And then the next day, uh, subordinate officials come out and clean up the comments and say, actually, we're just reiterating uh, existing yeah. policy. But, but I think that trend is likely to endure. And if anything, I, th I think that it will become more pronounced in the coming years because Republican candidates for president in 2024 are going to run against China. Uh, and when that will incentivize them to take very hawkish stands on Taiwan as well. Psychologically, where do you think the electorate will be on this? Will it be up for, there is this bipartisan consensus that you mentioned, but is the electorate really prepared for potentially a war over Taiwan? Well, we won't know until it happens, and hopefully it won't happen, but I would make a couple of points here. The first is that uh, opinion polling shows that a majority of Americans now favor using force to defend Taiwan from a Chinese attack. And that, that's fairly remarkable because there were times during the Cold War when less than a majority of Americans favored using force to defend West Germany from a Soviet assault. And so that's a pretty striking number. The second thing is that you know, the United States has this tendency of getting really annoyed when uh, big bad autocracies assault democracies or even non-democracies next door. And so in 1950, South Korea was outside of the American defense perimeter. The United States was operating on the assumption that it would not defend it if it were attacked. Uh, and Harry Truman made the opposite decision in June 1950 because he looked at this and he said, we don't want to live in the sort of world where uh, Soviet proxies can just knock over members of the free world next door. You saw a similar decision that was made after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait uh, in 1990, another country with which the United States did not have a defense treaty. And, and George H.W. Bush said that this would not stand because it was dangerous to allow this sort of precedent 
to be set. And so I, I think it's entirely possible you would get a similar reaction in the United States after a Chinese assault on Taiwan. I think there's, there's two caveats, though. The first is that the question obviously arises, well, what about Ukraine, right? And the United States did not intervene militarily in Ukraine. The Biden administration has made very clear that it has no plans to do so. Doing a huge amount on aid and training right. and intelligence, right. but not direct involvement. Right. Huge amounts of indirect support for, for Ukraine, but not direct U.S. military intervention. And I think what the Biden administration has been trying to do is say that Taiwan is different. Taiwan is different because its strategic significance is so great. Taiwan is different because it's in the part of the world that we view as the primary theater of competition. And so don't draw conclusions from the fact that we have not intervened militarily in Ukraine. The second caveat, though, is that it depends entirely on who is president. Uh, and, and so in both of the cases that I just mentioned, if an American president had decided that the United States should not fight uh, in, in Korea or in the Persian Gulf, the United States would not have gone to war. It took presidential leadership to make the case for why this was necessary. And so if there's a Chinese assault on Taiwan and Joe Biden or whoever follows him as president decides to make the case for American intervention, I think the American people will go along. I think they're, they're willing to be led on, on this issue. But if you have a president who makes the opposite decision, I think there'd be a significant amount of political leeway for that as well. On Russia, you know, where does Russia fit into Chinese thinking? Does it, really? I think Russia may be the most important country in the world as far as China is concerned right now. Uh, China has one major strategic partnership, and it's with Russia. China has systematically alienated many of the world's advanced democracies which has made it more dependent on Russia, even as Russia has also become more dependent on, on it. And the Russians and the Chinese both derive a lot of benefit from the strategic partnership that they have set up. And so the, the Russian Far East is basically denuded of military gear right now. And the Russians can make that move. They can, they can throw a lot of power at Ukraine because they're not at all worried about facing a threat along the Chinese border. China would have a similar advantage in a contest with the United States in the Western Pacific, and the, the two countries might find ways of aiding each other. So you uh, think it's, it's, not, well. it's sometimes presented as a kind of supplicant relationship with, with, with Russia desperately now needing, needing China, but you, you, you think it's, it's, it's about yeah. kind of coexistence and helping each other? If you had to say, you know, China's definitely the rider rather than the horse uh, in the relationship. But the fact is that, that China needs Russia because it has nowhere else to go at this point. If, if China were to turn away from Russia or the relationship were to take a downturn, China would be very strategically isolated at the moment. It, it has to have a friendly Russia on its borders if it's going to be taking a more confrontational policy vis-a-vis -vis the United States and its allies in the Western Pacific. And so there actually is a very high degree of dependence. And so this is one of the reasons why the Ukraine war presents such a problem for China. Because if it goes really, really badly for Russia, in the best case scenario, you're going to have a weakened Russia that is less useful as a, as a quasi-ally of China. In the worst case scenario, you may have political upheaval in Moscow, and then who knows what happens to the relationship. What about America's allies in this? I mean, who are the, the, the key powers? I mean, it's ultimately American military might that's gonna, gonna count when it comes to Taiwan or attempting to dissuade the, uh, the, the Chinese from, from doing it or trying it. But what other powers are significant? I mean, Japan's in a very interesting position at the moment. Where does Australia sit with the AUKUS business? How's Britain viewed? Is America actively trying to assemble a group of allies who might join, uh, join in a fight against China? There's an extraordinary amount of activity going on in trying to line up a larger and stronger coalition to oppose Chinese coercion or military aggression. And so American diplomats and military officials are having these conversations constantly. Uh, you mentioned Japan. I, I like to think that Japan is going to play the role in US foreign policy in the 21st century that Great Britain played in American foreign policy in the second half of the 20th century. It, it will be the indispensable ally on these issues, not just militarily, but, but technologically in many respects uh, as well. I think it's quite likely that Japan would enter a conflict uh, 
over Taiwan if the United States intervene. The Japanese have, have made pretty clear that they view Taiwan as a near existential issue for them just by, by reason of geography. And Japan is situated to play a very important role. It, uh, a, Ch a, China, a Chinese assault on Taiwan looks a lot less favorable from Beijing's perspective if they have to fight the global superpower plus a major regional power in Japan than it does if Japan stays on the sidelines. You go beyond Japan and uh, there is sort of a second ring of allies that I think are, are, are poised to play an important role, although perhaps a smaller role. Uh, Australia has become increasingly uh, assertive in pushing back against Chinese coercion. The Australian government has indicated that it would uh, be very hard pressed to stay on the sidelines in the event of a Chinese assault uh, on Taiwan. Uh, you've heard similar things in, in certain cases from the UK government. Uh, the challenge really is that there are, uh, there's another group of US allies and partners in the Asia Pacific whose uh, alignment is a little bit less clear on the issue. And so we, we can't be confident with respect to what we would get out of the Philippines, for mm -hmm. instance. And this is really important just for reasons of strategic geography. You know, South Korea might try to straddle the fence. I think both of those countries and a number of others are going to become more aligned with the United States on China issues rather than less in the coming years because they're just going to become more worried about what an aggressive China means for them. But again, the question is, how quickly will we get to this larger, more cohesive coalition? You mentioned technology there. And how important is that? Are those of us who think that, well, ultimately the democracies have an advantage because innovation is rooted in freedom and freedom of competition, a battle of ideas, and China can't really compete with that because it is an autocracy that's arguably moved to become a totalitarian state again, technologically equipped. Can China or the West win that technology battle? Who's your money on? My money would be on the West, although I would expand it to uh, sort of be the advanced democracies writ, writ large, because you know it, it's increasingly become the case that when we talk about the West, we're also talking about uh, Japan. We're also talking about South Korea in some ways, we're talking about Taiwan in, in certain ways. And so it's, it's a larger conception of the West than would have been the case, say, in in the 1950s. Or Sometimes the been, has been called D10. Yeah, so, so the D D10, T12, there are a variety of, of acronyms uh, that, that go with it. But it basically refers to this group of somewhere between you know, seven and 15 technologically advanced democracies. And if, and if those countries can really cooperate on these issues, pooling R&D resources, for instance, um, hardening supply chains and things like that, they're going to be extraordinarily well-placed to compete with China because they, they still account for a significant majority of global R&D spending. They uh, are, are, have dominant positions in key areas like semiconductor design and, and fabrication. And so it, as long as you can get cooperation among the world's major democracies, and as long as those democracies can take steps to ensure that the fruits of their own innovation aren't simply stolen by, by the CCP, I think that the, the balance of power and the balance of influence is still going to favor the good guys. So the West, the broadest sense of the term, can win. Liberty can win, you think? I think so. I, I think if I had to place money, I, I would place it on the United States uh, and its democratic allies and partners rather than on, on China. And, and it's worth keeping in mind that while we focus a lot on Chinese strengths and Chinese military strength in particular, and it's, it's proper to do so because the danger has become quite severe, if, if I were Xi Jinping, I, I would wake up in terror every night thinking about the problems that China faces, the, the growing economic problems with slowing uh, growth, uh, all of the demographic stresses that are about to exert major social and economic pressures on the country, the increasing brittleness of the political system, the way that the move towards a neo-totalitarian form of political control is starting to stifle some of the growth and innovation that made China what it is today. The headwinds that China faces in the future are going to be very, very severe. They may actually make China more dangerous in the near term by, by prompting Xi Jinping to act more rashly to grab the things that China wants today. Over the long term, however, I, I think they put the United States and its, its friends in relatively good stead in this competition. Hal Brands, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me.